Hey, this is four-time Black Belt World Champion Dominika Obelanite. If you guys are looking to level up your jiu-jitsu game with awesome jiu-jitsu courses on mindset, strategy, and beyond, make sure that you guys check out BGJ Mental Models Premium. I myself have a course up there, so make sure you guys check it out. Let's get you guys on that next step in your jiu-jitsu journey. Hey, welcome to BJJ Mental Models, episode 233. I'm Steve Kwan. BJJ Mental Models is your guide to a conceptual and intelligent jiu-jitsu approach. And today, back with a returning champ, friend of the show, Chris the Villain Pains. How's it going, Chris? Good morning. Good night. I have no idea which one it is anymore. It's uh, <laughs> For anyone listening, because of the, the time difference between me and Steve, it is 2 a.m. UK time. So I'm I'm obviously happy to be talking to you, sir. <laughs> yeah, clearly it's a priority for you to to take that time to come here, and I do appreciate it. Meanwhile, here it's a lovely warm 6 p.m. in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. But let's talk less about the weather here and more about jujitsu, because I do want to make sure you get to bed on time, Chris. Uh, thank you. <laughs> no worries. With that said, you know, it's been a while since you were on the podcast and you are a guest that we have had a lot of people say we should get back on. So glad to make it happen. But hey, with all of that said and done, you want to give yourself a quick intro? Sure. So just so I don't end up repeating myself from the last one. So I uh, I got my black belt from Preet Mickelson, who I'm pretty sure has been on this show probably the most by now, aside from yourself. Yeah, yeah. I think he holds the record with something like 10 appearances. He's been on the the main show with us three or four times, but then on our premium side, he did a whole bunch of episodes with us, yeah. breaking down his whole defensive BJJ system. So uh, if he's not number one in terms of appearances, he's up there somewhere. Yeah, so if, if people don't know him, that would be impressive, and they listen to this. So yeah, I got my, my black belt from him, but other than that, I'm actually self-taught in the UK. So I, I met Preet through Globetrotters when I was a brown belt, who I got my belts through Globetrotters. Then he started to come to the UK. I started to pay for him to come to the UK, learn the defensive nonsense that he is known for. And eventually he saw fit to give me my black belt for it. And, and since then, it's only taken off. I had a video, I don't know if you consider it going semi viral about four years ago about how to defend everything, which. Still does all right. Still people watch it and I still get uh, emails from people saying saying it's helped them, which is nice to know. Other than that, I have a few releases now through BJJ Fanatics. We did a bit of a longer form version of Defending Everything and we just had two releases come out yesterday. What was that like the, the 9th of May about learning jujitsu and uh, standing up? So that's a, a small introduction to my part of jujitsu, what I'm offering <laughs> Nice. And I got to ask, I don't think we got into this on the last time we talked, but the nickname, the villain, where does it come from? (laughs) So doing stuff with Preet, he'd listen to me, not only because I'd I'd be trying to work on my pressure on people or something to that account, and he'd hear me laugh at the same time. And he'd say, you you laugh like a criminal, you laugh like a villain. And... (laughs) You know, like a supervillain, like a cartoon supervillain. And just from that, I was like, out of all the nicknames I could ever choose, like that sounds awesome. So I thought, that ah, I'll stick with it. And um, one of my, uh, my my very dear friends is uh, one of my brown belts, Morgan Erdley. He uh, he does a lot of artwork in jiu-jitsu and uh, he hid our gym logo. And he's obsessed with Batman, or he was at least. And so... Knowing that how much he loves those kind of comics and uh, how good it would be at uh, drawing a Joker esque villain, it all kind of seemed kind of worthwhile to put it all together and like make that a bit of a brand. That makes a ton of sense. You know, I I've been wondering about this for a while. I assumed that the reason you had that nickname is because much like villains, you just always lose. But I think your explanation oh, oh, is much better. Oh, oh, oh. I didn't think of it that way. I think I think Preet said a nicer version. He's Estonian. Like he used to say that you know a villain is someone who is going against the norms and shaking up societal ways, etc. You you know Preet would say that someone who just loses. Like, 
I think that sounds more like pre. Like, I don't know if he put you up to that. Like you spoke to him recently and saying, oh yeah, I've got Chris on. Is there something horrible I can say to him? No, no. Like, so he loses a lot. I'll be honest with you. I've been sitting on that joke for about a year since our last appearance, just waiting for the oh. right time to use it. <laughs> oh, dude. Like, hit me when I'm down. Like, 10 past 2 in the morning. Like, you know, see, see a man weak, just kick him. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, 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 all of that said and done on the topic of controversial opinions, you're talking about, you know, getting people riled up. I was trying to come up with a topic for us to discuss, and I was thinking I could get you going on but about how, you know, techniques are dead and no one teaches techniques or something like that. You know, get Reddit all pissed off again. But <laughs> so, <laughs> something came up in our community that I thought was an amazing topic, and I inquired around and it was recommended to me that we should speak to you about this. And in fact, a bunch of people then chimed in and said, actually, I learned a lot about this from watching Chris Payne's videos. And that topic that I want to talk about with you today is grip fighting from the top specifically. When this question landed on my desk and I started digging around, I realized, you know what? There really aren't that many resources that explain how to do this properly. And most people never teach it in class. I mean, most instructors, they barely spend enough time on grip fighting in general, let alone from the top position. It is something that when people think about, they're normally thinking about how to retain their grips from guard or maybe play the stand-up game. But man, if you're on top, whether it be trying to open a guard, secure the pass, hold a dominant position, grip fighting is equally important. And in fact, failing to do it properly is usually why you're going to get chopped down or swept or submitted, even though you're on top position. So with that said, man, that was the topic I had planned for today. And I'd love to dig into it with you if you think that's a good one. Yes, please. Absolutely. It's a bit of a hot button topic at our gym currently. So uh, it'd be nice to, to get some ideas out uh, regarding that. <laughs> Perfect. Well, I'll turn it over to you first, then maybe you can start by telling me a bit about your general grip fighting strategy and if what you do from top position varies at all from how you would do it from the bottom. So a couple of influences where it's come to this has been obviously Preet for, for the most part and Vim Deputa, who I'm not sure if he's been on this before as well, but he's an exceptional black belt from Belgium. Completely awesome style of jiu-jitsu, very, very methodical and intelligent way of explaining things. I highly recommend anyone listening to check out some of his work. It's normally we're all come parcel really and do a lot of work together but a couple of essentially so what kind of put me onto it was once pre first visited the uk and we started learning these defensive postures uh running man and turtle specifically we thought that we were kind of badass with them we were, we were meeting local gyms going to competitions and people weren't breaking through the top at all and that was we could just close the door and, and that was it. And, you know, people could pass our guard, we'll get past our legs, but they'd never get side control. They'd just end up hitting this brick wall. And we felt pretty confident with it. And then we paid for Preet to come back over again. And myself and one of my other students rolled with him during the day when he just arrived. And as soon as he passed our guard, the first thing he did was grab my wrist and just pull my arm open. And I was like, that seems so ridiculously stupid that why didn't I ever think of that? Um, because it got to the point where I don't want to like generalize or just generally laugh at jujitsu people, but by and large, when I've seen people trying to attack the the missing gaps, as it were, like so, if anyone hasn't come across this before with the the running man and the the pre star turtle, is we're trying to attach our the top third of our elbows, our forearms, to our thighs and our hip flexors, and like completely close down our sides sides of our body like rib cages so no one can get any sort of underhooks and best way of explaining it is imagine the space between your elbow and your armpit being like a red space like if someone's in that space you've, you've really messed up and you need to get them out of that space um the distance between your your elbow and your hip right, so that is like an amber space in that you're not completely messed up yet but if they get into that space, it's very easy then to like pummel your wrist through the elbow into the red space again. And so the the kind of integral space from initially when I met Preet was to hide that amber space and reconnect your elbow to your thigh. And if I'm doing this from from playing Running Man Turtle, people would like just try and like iron fist, like just jab their hand through the gap, like to the point of like hurting their fingers. 
almost like like they're trying to like punch sand and like get stronger like uh, spear hand punches um and it seems almost funny that you know they they see this gaps closed and they just try and punch her way through it and then pre comes around and instead of trying to punch her way through it he just grabs my wrist pops my elbow a little bit and then just gets back into the space anyway and i thought oh oh yeah you can hand fight from the top <laughs> after they've passed and then I remember even doing a, a, a private in my gym and one of my students had come back from a, a he'd, he'd left before Preet had arrived and he'd come back post Preet and he had that same issue. He was a big guy. He was, he was like, he was about six foot eight or something like that. He's a, he's a big dude. And he's had that same issue saying like, yeah, I keep hurting my fingers just trying to like find these gaps on people. I thought, you ever, you ever thought just grabbing their wrist and just pulling their arm over so slightly? And he just looked at me and like, oh, yeah, that makes way more sense. Like, and that was like the, the first foray into, okay, well, it's not just in guard that you should be hand fighting. Like anytime you want to get back into someone's armpit and pummel, if they've closed the gap, then go to the end of the lever and just pop it ever so slightly. And then uh, Pre was doing a bit of work on closed guard um same with francesco and uh one thing that they both did was to essentially like grab the hand and force it into grab the bottom person's hand and force it into their their opposing pocket as it were and considering all the the things that i'd seen previously with regards to being on top especially in the gi of oh you have to grab the wrist this way or, or uh, grab the, the gi this way or twist it that way or grab the gi pants etc always left the hands free and they went well why are we leaving the hands free just put their hand in their pocket because then it doesn't matter if they're in gi or no gi, they can't do anything. And then uh, the the final kind of the final part of the puzzle came from Vim, who talked about the pocket, as in if we're more than arm's length apart, there is no fight. We're, we're too far away from each other. And if we're you know face to face, now we're in a clinching distance, and pummeling is important, and underhooks and overhooks and etc. But in between that space, that's the pocket, and whoever wins that hand fight gets to get their clinch gets to do their technique and that just resonated across like most guard exchanges when the person on the bottom is is looking to capitalize with anything it's all based upon right i am going to drag the arm this way i'm going to stuff the hand between the legs for a triangle etc so it's all it's all essentially just hand fighting but taught from this idea that well the person on top doesn't isn't using their hands at all and you just grabbing them, doing what you want, and getting your technique, going to your clinch distance technique. And it just kind of made me think, well, that's all well and good, but what if the other person is hand fighting on top? If you're not having that kind of increased resistance training on the bottom of against someone who's actually hand fighting you, then all your techniques are kind of theater, just compliant training. Um, and so to improve, the same as uh, to improve people's control on top, dealing is, is to deal with people who are hiding the gaps like making you a more efficient hunter of exposing people's armpits and, and pinning them on their back the same could be said for improving people's attacks from guard if if the person on top isn't giving you sufficient hand fighting in exchange once you're in that pocket distance all the techniques you're doing are, are kind of worthless yeah, yeah yeah that's a really good point and a good observation too which is that many grapplers they don't really think about the different phases of the fight and the importance of winning that grip fight at the beginning. The most important thing you can do to set yourself up for success positionally is to win the grip fight. It is very hard to advance or improve your position if you've lost the grip fight. In fact, advice I often give to people is if you're losing the grip fight, meaning your opponent is the one kind of managing where your hands are going and you don't have a lot of control over that, you need to focus on winning that grip fight and turning the situation around before you try to advance. You see this a lot with lower belts, for example, where they'll be perhaps on top and they'll be clearly losing the grip fight where their, you know, their arms are all tied up and tangled up and they can't move them freely but they think they see a window and so they try to pass and you never want to do that if you lost the grip fight if the other person controls your arms because you're just going to get swept or submitted or something bad's going to happen and i thought for a while that this might just come back to again how comfortable we all are with the guard and how much we train it if you think about how in many schools you drill these techniques or you you start the sparring 
in many situations, you're instructed to begin positionally. So we want to work on the guard. So we kind of just walk into the guard mindlessly and we get into our position and then we start fighting from there. But in reality, I mean, you never want to walk into someone's guard if you can avoid it. That's one of the worst tactical decisions you can make in a jujitsu match is to just willingly walk into someone's guard and let them tie you up. The easiest way to deal with the guard is just to never get tangled in there in the first place. And that's where grip fighting comes into play and why it's so important. Because if you just always stay in, in a good position and, you know, you were talking about fighting in the pocket, Rob Bernacki has talked about this as the engagement phase. Phase. So basically, before a position is solidified, what happens? Like, what's going on? And it's usually going to be grip fighting and kind of jockeying to see who gets those dominant grips. I think that generally speaking, in most situations, people would be better off focusing on dominating that grip fight before they start trying to lock up a position and advance position. So just in terms of the order of attack, I think that's always just good advice, even from top position, which is to win the grip fight before you do anything else. Oh, completely. I mean, I think, again, though, it's, I know a lot of the work that you're doing and the more conceptual approaches to jujitsu are changing a lot of gyms out there. But, you know, I've, I've been to seminars, I've been to other gyms that still feel like it's, it's 15 years ago and, you know, we're still doing the same, you know, all right, okay, I'm standing, climbing into this person's clothes guard and I'm going to grab their gi and go twist it this way. And, it feels silly to say some of these things sometimes because they seem so obvious, but also at the same time, it feels like there's a, a lot of jujitsu that hasn't progressed in in 20 years. And one of the interesting things about when I first look at, started looking at these defensive postures was the, the grilled chicken open guard. And the general way of explaining it was to stop people from, you know, I don't want anyone behind my head, in my armpits, or behind my legs, which or behind my knees, should I say, which is exactly the same as, as wrestling. I don't want anyone in those places in wrestling. And the exact same if I'm in top of someone's guard. If someone's on their back and I'm approaching them, the three places that I don't want them are behind my head, in my armpits, or behind my knees. I mean, that's combat base, which is essentially a shot in, in wrestling. And so if these two people are pretty much holding the exact same position as their person on their back is, is stopping the person on top, you know, going behind the head, the armpits, or behind the knees, and the person on top, doesn't want them in those places either. They're essentially coming in in a closed up stance and then hand fighting each other in a way to expose those gaps on another person because you can't attack without exposing. So you're trying to get them to expose, control once they've exposed, win the hand fight, and then climb into that gap on the other person without getting caught yourself. I mean, one of the interesting things actually with regards to this is, and it's completely changed the dynamic, and especially made the, the hand fighting more important, if anything, or the grip fighting, shall I say, is one thing we've been introducing a lot recently just due to Charles Harrier and his, and hopefully if he ever listens to this, he'll hate it and he refer to it as Kindle Guard, where he just stands up all the damn time. And I know that's kind of like one of the big things currently of, of just stand up, but it's all well and good being able to say, it. and it's something that you know, obviously have you've seen the the Craig Jones fanatics DVD saying the same thing, and you know it's all it's all everyone seems to be saying right now is just get the hell up. Why are you on the floor? Get the hell up. But it didn't really resonate in that and change the gym until I kind of banned guard in a way, and so I, I said to the the students, right, okay, well if you're on your ass, there's three options: you either sweep, you sub, or you stand. But for the time being, you only sweep or sub if you cannot stand. Okay, you will stand. That all of a sudden changed everything because if I'm not engaging from the top and holding that other person down, they're just going to get up. And so all kind of like standing, passing and not engaging on the pass once someone's hit the floor seemed completely Again, like theater, like some sort of Aikido match. Like I'm expecting you to do something and what I'm doing only works when you're doing the expected thing. My passes only work under the proviso that you just stay on the floor. I know in, in competitions and people will try and get up and get on top, especially if they've been taken down. And so, especially in, in MMA as well, like no one wants to be on the floor. But the big change is, is that, right, well, how... Outlier, I should say, is, is gym jujitsu. I mean, what we do in the in the gym on a daily basis doesn't mostly match self defense, competitive jujitsu, or MMA. Like we we willfully lie on the floor, 
um, play this expected guard and our passes are based upon this expectation that the person just lies there until they get a sweep and get on top. But pulling their bottom leg free and doing a technical stand-up at any point isn't factored in. Like I remember I did a seminar at the weekend where there was a purple belt holding, he's been trained for about 10 years at this point, and he was doing a half guard. I said, well, if they're not controlling your bottom leg whilst you're in the bottom of half guard, get up. Just frame your arm and just pull your bottom leg free and stand up. And the look on his face was, oh, so you're saying in the past 10 years, every time I've been stuck in this position, <laughs> I could have just got up. Yes. <laughs> and the look on the other guy's face like, oh, yeah, I never thought he could do that. <laughs> It's funny you bring that up because it reminds me of Chris Hodder has talked about this and how you yes. should beware the seductive nature of the guard. And what he means by that is, look, the guard is is fun. It's intricate. It's like a puzzle box, right? It's exciting to solve. And we are all subjected to jujitsu marketing, right? The reason we got into this is because of the the lore of Hoist Gracie just rocketing through the UFC, fighting off of the bottom. And so we kind of get it into our heads that this is how you're supposed to do jujitsu, right? You sit down, you go to the bottom position, and then you try to set up some intricate sweep. And I remember when I first kind of saw people challenge that. I remember back when Fedor fought Minotaro Noguera. And, you know, there was this big question about, you know, is Fedor going to be able to, to handle Minotaro's jiu-jitsu? And I remember the thing that stood out for me watching that fight was Fedor refused to play jiu-jitsu with this guy the way that he wanted to play, right? He went down and he just sat in the dude's guard and just teed off on his face. And George St. Pierre would go on to also popularize the same strategy. And, you know, it, it gets me to think that there's some things that we do in the sport because of protocol or because it feels in line with what we think jiu-jitsu is supposed to be. But that doesn't necessarily mean it's the most effective thing to do. And there are a whole bunch of examples in jiu-jitsu, particularly around the guard, that tie into that. And one of them is that we have a tendency to just kind of sleepwalk into someone else's guard because we're so used to training that position. That's what we think jiu-jitsu is, right? If I see a man sitting on the ground with his, you know, his chest facing up to the ceiling and his legs spinning in the air like an upside down turtle who can't turn himself around again. The first thing I'm going to think is I'm going to hop into this dude's guard, right? But the worst thing to do if you want to actually win a grappling match is to just walk into someone's guard. You should be setting up passing sequences before you get into their guard. You should be trying not to get entangled into their guard. And to me, that's where the grip fighting from the top aspect comes from. Well, that's actually quite interesting in that I'm really going to have to like deep dive in, into my own head really over the next uh, few months on this. But so Preet was back in the UK recently and he went and did some training at a, a staff to fire BJJ. So it was a, a mixture of different jujitsu clubs there. And I, I pretty much went representing well my gym. Uh, no one else was available that day. And one of the, te <laughs> the thing that Preet was covering is his sideways guard, sideways open guard, which is essentially lying almost turned over on the floor, pulling your bottom arm and leg free and standing up once someone's tried to like standing past your guard. So it's almost like an uh, overcommitted shrimp in that way. So instead of your, your butt facing the floor, you've kind of gone past the vertical and now your groin's facing the floor. And... It was weird that we've been playing this recently. And one thing he actually said during this was, I'd prefer to show this to beginners because it's easier to get up than to play guard because guard is too intricate and they're more likely to fail if they try and shrimp and just pull guard. But one of the drills that you kind of set was, okay, well, you're in this kind of, you've slightly like does standing pass, you pass the other person's legs. They're in this turned over sideways guard. Person on top, I need you to, to try and pin the other person on their back person on the bottom get up and it was kind of destined to fail anyway because the bottom person's arm and leg had already gone missing bottom arm bottom leg had already gone missing so they're already up in that sense it's going to be very hard to, to roll them onto their back again but what i did was i i the second that kind of like we started this drill is i kind of went straight for the guy's hips hooked my leg through his bottom leg essentially pulling top half guard and rolled him back onto his back again i did this repeatedly and uh, when it came to the end of the drill, you know, the, the guy was with the brown belt was saying, oh, I couldn't stand up. And Preet said, oh, yeah, but you, you got your guard back against Chris. I was like, no, he didn't. And he went, yeah, you got half guard on you. I was like, no, I got top half. And that was kind of like a tree falling in the woods moment for me of, I want to be here. 
Because if I pass his guard, I lose control of his hips and his legs. He's going to square himself up to the floor and do a technical get up on me. And I thought, why am I passing his guard? Like I could understand it from a, a perspective of a sport where you're only allowed to do upper body attacks like chokes and arm, arm attacks, but I can do leg locks. So why would I need to pass? Passing doesn't make any sense to me because against someone who can stand up, if I lose control of the legs and I don't have brilliant pinning over the shoulders, they're going to stand up. So if I can leg lock, I'm just going to chill back here. I'm going to carry on with my grip fighting and I'll just leg lock him. I don't need to pass. And that was like a, a big tree falling in the woods moment for me of, oh, I'm the person on top. I'm changing that kind of narrative in my head of if I'm approaching someone's guard, it's always kind of been, you know, me teaching it and me seeing it that being the person on top in someone's guard, I'm the loser. I'm the person under threat. Yet it's very, very rare in places like MMA and and then in leg locking jujitsu that the person on top is under that much threat when they're in the guard because they can leg lock just as much or they just go punch the other guy. And so I then realized that a lot of the fights I have against you know, decent black belts who, who try and get up, like some of my black belts, I don't even bother trying to pass their guard because I know as soon as I pass, I'm going to lose control of their upper body at some point and they're just going to get up on me. I'd rather just stick back here, keep their legs pinned with my legs. And then once I've won the kind of top grip fight, I'll go for my attack. And so I'm now playing guard from the top in a way that a person would play guard from the bottom, if that makes sense. Makes perfect sense. Makes perfect sense. And, you know, it's funny you bring that up because I just had my brother on here recently and we were talking about the evolving strategies of attacking from top position in the guard. When I started jujitsu, the advice was pass at all costs, right? You know, if you think you're going to get the pass, if you're on the way, make that pass happen. It is your priority to pass the person's guard. But then the issue is people get so used to this that they get really good about regarding or turtling or framing or grand being. And it gets really hard to actually just go from guard to side control. So the prevailing logic then evolved a bit that, hey, if you're going to pass, rather than trying to stop in side control, you can slingshot right around to north, south or the other the other side of side control. So basically go faster, right? Go, go faster, go further to secure this past just blitz right through their defenses. And it's interesting because, hey, that that can work. I have used that approach a lot to get past someone's guard is to just pass right through and go right around them. But now the prevailing wisdom is very much to take your time, you know, just put pressure on them. There's no, well, I mean, maybe there is. It depends on the, the match, right? But in a lot of situations, there is no urgent need to pass the guard right now. And sometimes just sitting there and making the person suffer and creating openings is a better strategy rather than just trying to run right through their guard before it's time. So that to me has been a big breakthrough, which is it is okay to sit in someone's half guard. You can make someone's life really suck if you're sitting on top of them in half guard and use that as an opportunity to open them up, to make sure their hands aren't able to grab you effectively. And then from there, once you feel that you've got dominant control of the position, then you can pass. I mean, if you want to, right? In jujitsu, in a lot of rule sets, it's a good idea to. But like you said, when you disentangle your legs, there is always that possibility that the person can just pop up. And you do have to be mindful of that, especially given rule sets where, you know, passing guard might not be awarded points. Yeah, exactly. And it was it was interesting as well, because at the end of the seminar, pre kind of signed off on it by saying, from this position that he's currently espousing with this sideways guard where the second they kind of speed pass and they lose control of your hips, you can stand up. He said that he signed off by saying, this will change how you pass the guard because all of a sudden standing passing won't work because the person on bottom will just get up. And that kind of like made sense to me in the sense of I'm already having to do this and I'm having to control their bottom leg at all times or they just stand up. And so I find myself forcing people into half guard, as it were, as a way of controlling them or like at least stopping them from pulling their bottom leg free. And I remember we went for, for lunch afterwards and I turned around to him. I said, that seminar was entirely pointless, <laughs> which, you know, maybe he's rubbed off on me a bit too much with being open to him and blunt. And he looks at me like, quite, why? So because it's, they haven't got the emphasis on standing up 
Like they, if I said to everyone, right, cool, great seminar, fantastic, thanks, thanks, Preet, for your time. Uh, right, guys, we'll just roll. Most of that room is going to go back to exactly how they were, and they're just going to pull guard again. As in, and they won't try and stand up. They've got no real reason to stand up. They're just going to pull guard. Um, so you've given them a solution to a problem they haven't come across yet. They have. I can refer to guard these days as like a parasite. In the once someone has it in their head that it's okay to be on your back, you'll flop to your back easier and easier as time goes on. I mean, over in the UK, we have like a lot of uh, rugby players um, who do end up lost and appearing in jujitsu gyms every now and then. <laughs> and I hate, I used to hate rolling with them because I could sweep, you know, jujitsu people all the time, blue belts, purple belts. And then you come across this white belt rugby player who just comes stacking in with all this pressure. And I couldn't sweep him. And you'd be like, well, why isn't this technique working on a white belt when it easily works on blue belts and purple belts? And it's because they haven't been conditioned to go to their back. Like they haven't been infected with that parasite. And it's only over time that you then teach them the guard that all of a sudden they become easier and easier to sweep. You you basically condition them down to accepting being on their back again. But once you kind of change the emphasis to being on top is the best place to be, do not go to your back at any cost. You suddenly become a lot more honest with actually how good your sweeps are. And so it's, it's that's what I mean. It's kind of banging that drum to people that don't be on your back unless you absolutely have to. Because that would then change your understanding of passing. Like if you're not controlling the bottom leg, they can get up at any moment. And so if your passing is is disconnected, if by the time you enter that, you know, you've done your takedown and you're in that kind of pocket distance, if you're not hand fighting and, and breaking through that distance to try and control their bottom leg and being aggressive on the person on top's perspective, they're just going to get up. And that's essentially what then Preet was saying is that this will have to completely change how you, you play guard. But it's a message that hasn't hit a lot of people yet. And if the parasite is still wheeling its way through their brains, they're just going to accept going onto their back again the second you tell them to roll. Hopefully that was a bit of a ramble. I don't know if that made sense or not. You can see the time starting to affect me. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it actually made perfect sense to me. And you touched on something there that I was hoping you would bring up, which is the importance of when you're grip fighting from the top of being mindful of their legs and controlling their legs as well as their arms. Like you said, a lot of jujitsu people are way too happy to just see the bottom position and sit there and basically let you as the top person just amble over into their guard. But the problem is, as you wisely brought up, that requires a very compliant opponent who is willing to play by the rules of jiu-jitsu, where it's okay to just seed the bottom position. And the fun thing about sparring with white belts is they aren't conditioned that way. They'll do whatever intuitively makes sense or whatever they've drawn on from other athletic disciplines in the past. And there's not many other athletic disciplines where flopping around on the floor on your back is a good idea, right? So the challenge is people often don't think enough about the fact that my opponent always has the option of just standing up, right? They don't have to sit there and try to pendulum sweep me or whatever. They can just get up and the onus is on me as the top player to watch where their feet are. I remember for me where this lesson, where I learned it, I was sparring with this blue belt, really young guy, but really, really small. You know, I probably outweighed him by a ton, but he was just super fast, very, very hard to control. And every time I put him onto the floor, he was right back up again. And I just, I mean, I was able to, to hit the techniques I wanted on him that I could. I was able to put his butt onto the ground, but just he would get up so quick. And that's kind of when I realized that it's not enough to just do jujitsu on the top side of someone's body. You have to be mindful of where their feet are, because if they can get their feet under them, they can just get back up. And, you know, if that's a sweep, then there's no sweep anymore. If they just get right back up before any point are awarded. It applies just as well when you're fighting from the top. As the top player, you have to be mindful of the fact that if the person's legs are free, getting up is an option. And so you always have to just kind of in the back of your mind, have an understanding of where their feet are at. And if you're not grabbing their feet at that moment, you have to make sure that you've got some easy way to control that. Because yeah, otherwise, if you just let the person just sit there and their feet are, you know, just not being attended to, it's very easy for them to just get up. And then any positional advantage you might've had is now gone. Completely. It was interesting as well. So a lot of this kind of came around almost like by accident in that 
you know, hadn't been fully digested a lot of what Craig was doing and, and this whole idea of standing up is, uh, so if I'm on my back and I'm going for a sweep, I'm essentially trying to, first and foremost, roll the other person onto their back. It's usually the way that I, I kind of interpret sweeps. I want to put the other person who is on top onto their ass. But if I fail that, if I don't roll them onto their ass, I still want to be on top. So I, you know, say if that kind of fails and they keep themselves square to the ground, say if they're like this rugby player who's not accepting going to their back. If I just come out the side of the door and I get on top of them, I still consider that a win. And so it soon start to realize that okay, I might not hit the Instagram perfect sweep where they go flying onto their back like a scissor sweep and then I square myself to the ground and I get on top of them. Uh, it could be something dirty. It could be you know, a bit of a scramble where... You know, I hit them with a sweep, they they base out, but I've, I've generated some space and I get on top of them. And then I realized that, right, well, if that's all I really need to do is to get on top of them, to win this exchange off my ass, do I even have to do a sweep? Like, can't I just get up anyway? Because isn't that what a sweep is? Just getting up and on top, like regardless if they get rolled or not. Now, if I end up on their back instead of them on their back, I still consider that pretty decent. And so that then realized that if I can essentially do like a hip ice and like square myself to the ground, um, essentially, you know, free my bottom leg, you know, technical stand up, et cetera, that's a sweep. I'm, I'm getting up, which then kind of informed that opinion that, right, well, if I'm on top, if I'm not controlling that bottom person's leg, they can just get out. And I, and it was kind of weird is that I was trying to teach this to beginners. Unless you, get submitted from someone's guard if you can just stay on top of someone what else are they really going to get you with like they're not you know maybe some outlier you know buggy choke or something from side control or some dastardly ezekiel from the bottom of mount but by and large there's not a lot of things that wouldn't you know that people can submit you with if it isn't from within their guard so i really reiterate to people right well be on top then because that was going to delete a large portion of bad things that are going to happen to you. Just be utterly belligerent from day one and go, no, sorry, I don't see any exchange here where I am underneath you. If my hips are higher than yours, I'm the person on top. So I will stay this way. Like, you know, from, from a, it seems almost stupid to say it out loud is whoever has the higher hips is on top. Whoever's on top is on top. Like, it seems almost stupid, but it's amazing how much you'll let your hips drop below the other person's in just general exchanges. Like you just allow yourself to to become the bottom person. But if I just beat in someone and said, no, there's there's no way you're you're going to allow their hips to get above yours. You will float above them at all times. Then the only thing they can do is, is attack you from in their guard. And if you don't let them have their hands, then what are they going to get you with from their guard? And so it seemed like the aside from teaching for someone the defensive postures for once their ass hits the ground and they're on their back and to cover up and not allow themselves to get pinned, this seemed like the best way of, of keeping someone safe in jiu-jitsu. Be the person on top, that's going to delete a lot of options, and pin someone's hands into their pockets, which you're the person on top. You've got weight and gravity on your side. And that person that who's in their guard, if they lose tension in their abs and their legs, they lose their guard. You have no reason to pass because unless you've got a will to attack their upper body for chokes and arm bars, why else would you pass? Which kind of makes sense from a historical jiu-jitsu perspective of, oh, we're the art that doesn't like leg locks. Right, okay, so I guess you have to get past the legs to do your attacks then. Mm -hmm. But since the world has changed and now we do leg locks, there is no real reason to pass. So it was just, again, kind of like... Once I started to remove guard out of the equation of, of this is too much high coordination stuff to teach a beginner, then what would I put in its place? And just, again, that reiteration of don't let someone get the parasite in their head that it's okay to go to your back. You know, Chris Houter's four rules of jiu-jitsu, be the person on top, win on top, stay on top. If you have a guard, have a guard, they will not pass. Do not forget rule number one due to the seductive nature of rule number three. And if you can just, I say just... As soon as you find yourself south of someone's legs, control their bottom leg and then just keep stuffing their hands into their pockets. Keep controlling their wrists. Keep doing two-on-one grips, you know, grabbing the wrist and the elbow and putting their hands in their pockets and just what else would you need to know to stay safe? Just to clarify, when you talk about putting their hands in their pockets, what specifically do you mean there? So as in that would be like 
imagine you're on the bottom and someone, you know, you're playing like a half guard or close guard, etc. And someone just grabs your wrist and your elbow and forces your left hand into your right pocket and pins it into your hip. Okay. So basically you're forcing their own hand to be glued into their hip. So it's taken out of play. Yeah, completely. And then because it's right. kind of a cross that the free hand has no strength behind it. Got it. Got it. Makes sense. Makes sense. And it was, again, it was, it was I, I say this from, a, again, a position of guilt is that when I first started doing jujitsu, I had a coach for the first six months, eight months, and he'd show loads of setups for, for various things. And being in love with this sport, I then went down the rabbit hole of very early YouTube, which was essentially just Submissions 101 and Eddie Bravo stuff. And I was just trying to find loads of setups. And because I was, I'd come from a traditional Japanese jiu-jitsu background, I had like a, the idea that it'd be like a curriculum so I used to write all my techniques out on Excel, essentially. I table everything. I write, what are my options from here? So right to get to a triangle, I can push their hands in between here. So I need five setups from triangles. Okay, there's five setups from triangles. I just wrote all everything I could down. So every time I see a new setup or see a new pass or whatever, you know, right, okay, that's a new grip I can use to get through this. It was only after years that I kind of realized that if I was to fill a room with smoke, and shine a laser pen through the particles um i'd hit some combination of particles so i'm getting from point a to point b and i've illuminated these particles and that's like a, a setup in jiu-jitsu that once upon a time for that person these particles aligned and they made their way from point a to point b and when you try and copy that you're trying to you're waiting for particles of chaos to realign themselves, which you may be able to force them to realign themselves. But if something's off, if you're just like seeing it very down the barrel, like I did very, very specifically, like, no, these particles have to be in this alignment for this to be the technique, you won't pull the trigger. But then I realized that as long as I understand where I am and where I want to go, I can find my own way through these particles. There's a billion ways of getting from point A to point B of aligning these particles of smoke. And what are those setups, if not hand fighting? That that coach is essentially saying, once upon a time, I did this hand fight against this other person and I got my technique. And so I then sort of, well, why would I then teach individual setups when I can just tell people that this is where you're gonna start. This is your major position. This is how you're gonna finish, a triangle, guillotine or whatever. Right, well, person on top, I need you to give increasing amounts of hand fighting. And person on bottom, you're going to try and find your way there. And then to be a better person on top, to be a better partner, be a better coach. Say if you did like levels one to 10. Level one, that person's going to find it very easy to get from point A to point B. But by level 10, that person on top is just, it's almost like sparring. They're going to be the most aggressive, non-compliant person possible. But every time you go up a level from, you know, say if at level four, you know, they get their triangle. They do a setup and get a triangle. And I think, well, okay, level five, well, I need to make it harder for them. And so your hand fighting has to improve to be a better person for that person on the bottom. So just by sheer side effect, you're getting better hand fighting because you don't want to let the other person down. Instead of just being a compliant person who's just allowing them to do their combination of hand fighting that once worked for the other person. Yeah. Yeah. You know, what you brought up there is is interesting and it sounds like we're kind of getting into the and I'm not surprised we're talking a bit about <laughs> thinking in concepts instead of thinking in techniques. And you brought up this great example of how, look, your goal is to get from point A to point B and how you do it. The specifics of how you do it is less important than just kind of having like general guidelines that you can follow to keep moving in the right direction. I think with a lot of people, when they wind up in someone's guard, especially at the junior belts, but even at the the senior belts, it can happen too. It's possible to get a little bit paralyzed because like you said, there's so many things that can happen in someone's guard. The variables is just out of control. And if in your head, the way that you're thinking is, I must execute these 
10 passing steps in perfect sequence, then as soon as your opponent varies from that sequence, you're going to have trouble. You're not going to know what to do next and you're going to kind of fall off the rails. Whereas if you just think in terms of general ideas, like some of the things you said earlier, you know, don't let them get access to your, your kind of your inside space by your armpits, control their legs, you know, deny their guard instead of walking into their guard. Little things like that will always be applicable when you're attacking someone from top position. And I have personally found that to be an easier way to cut through the noise when I'm in a a highly variable position like the guard. It's a bit easier to spar with someone when you're in a more definitive position. Like if you're mounted on top of them, I mean, yeah, there's variability, but you know, you can count on on one hand, probably the things that are likely to happen if I mount on someone. Whereas if I'm sitting in your guard, I can't predict what you're going to do, right? You have so many options as the person on the bottom that trying to execute a a step-by-step sequence in my head, trying to like memorize and repeat a sequence is just not going to work most of the time because my opponent won't give me what I need to do that. So in my head, when I'm attacking someone from top position, I'm usually not thinking, okay, I need to do a Toriando pass. What are the 10 steps? Okay, one, two, three, go. What I'm normally thinking is more things like, okay, are my elbows in? Are they able to grab my elbows or do I have them properly defended? Am I defeating their grips and swimming and making sure that I don't try to advance position? until I've won the grip fight? Am I monitoring where their feet are? You know, stuff like that. There's just a handful of things you have to always be thinking about. And those are always going to apply regardless of what guard your opponent is actually trying to play. I mean, one of the other useful things that I, again, I show my my new belts when they they, they first kind of joined jiu-jitsu is this idea that when you're in that kind of forward-facing exchange, um, there's a an inside and an outside person so by that, I mean, who's in between the other person's legs and guards kind of like can be categorized that way. So, you know, if, if the other person, the person at the bottom is doing like a closed guard, that person's on the outside and thus making the person on top on the inside. But if the person on the bottom is doing a butterfly guard, they're now in between the top person's legs. So making the bottom person, the inside person, the top person, the outside person. And so the reason that's kind of important is it allows it's not it's not black and white there's always like you know gray area techniques but it's a a good rule of thumb to kind of live by is the person on the outside can do upper body attacks and the person on the inside can do lower body attacks so if i'm saying close guard as a person on the bottom i'm on the outside so i can do arm bars kimuras guillotines triangles you know upper body attacks the other person's in between my legs it's going to be very hard for them to do arm bars and triangles on me, but they can definitely do leg locks. But if I'm the person on the bottom and I'm doing butterfly, it's going to be very hard for me to do a triangle. But if they expose the back of their knees, it's going to be very easy for me to do a leg lock. And that means that as a beginner, they don't have to know the guard. They just have to know what am I in relation to the other person? Am I inside or the outside person? Because then they can pretty much remove 50% of the options that are, they're vulnerable to. To the point where if they don't feel comfortable with something, they can change the narrative once they approach the other person's guard. So if I'm approaching someone who keeps their feet kind of glued together, well, I'm going to assume that you're a leg locker. So why would I approach and let you play butterfly? Because I'm putting you in a situation that's playing to your A game. So I will only kind of engage once I'm in between your legs because I've now taken you out of your game because I feel more comfortable with you attacking my upper body than my lower body. And so, again, it's kind of that kind of general, you know, general kind of, right, if you just, I don't need to teach you guards, but if I'm going to teach you this to keep you safe, are you inside or outside? Because then you can you can just focus on that other part of your body to maintain a level of safety to it. But also know that you, again, if you're as the person on the inside on top, if you force them into close guard, then completely you have, you don't have to pass. You can just go for their legs. And the interesting guard for me then is half because it's both at the same time, because we both have an inside leg and we both have an outside leg. I mean, it's the Wild West. It's everything, everything, everywhere, all at once. Let's let's go for upper body and lower body at the same time from both angles. And so that's kind of one of the later guards that I have to like warn people about is that, right, this is a position where you are now fully exposed. You can have everything done to you, but you have everything at your disposal. This is the only guard where you can dars, Kimura and guillotine someone and heel hook them at you know, soon after. Yeah, that's a brilliant point and something that I think many people don't think about when they consider how to 
organized positions in their head. You know, when you're playing guard on the bottom, you're often very aware of, okay, do I have the inside or the outside position? But when you're the person on top, you can somewhat predict what your opponent is going to do, or at the bare minimum, you can at least understand what they could do that would be likely to succeed based on whether they're attacking an inside or outside position. So you brought up butterfly guard. If someone, for example, is playing butterfly guard against me, one of the things that I don't want to do is let them get under me and control my center of gravity because then they're going to go into leg entanglements and stuff, right? So that is going to impact how I, as the top player, attack them because I'm going to want to make sure I don't lean too far forward to the point where they can get right under me. I'm going to want to make sure I don't open myself up to something like an armor a collar drag where they can pull me forward and on top of them. But if you compare that to a more outside guard, like Delahiva guard, for example, if someone attacks from there, I have a different understanding of what they're probably going to do. They're probably going to try to get me to sort of look away from them. They're going to try to get angled so that I'm not able to face them directly. They're probably going to try to either wobble me and sweep, or maybe they're going to try to, you know, they could try to matrix. They could try to go around and take my back. So I have some indication of what they're going to try to do. And that's important to know when you're the person on top attacking from the guard because there are so many things that can happen in the guard. And if you can narrow down those probabilities, you're just going to be more effective. So that's very good advice. It was also, I went to a Chris Houter seminar years ago, and he said, you know, every guard pass kind of falls into the categories of um, over, under, round, and through. And I was like, okay, I'm going to keep that. That sounds like a really good little bit of information. And then... um, Chris Graugart, the uh, BJJ Globetrotter, he did a seminar. It was one of his, his camp seminars in Leuven like six, seven years ago. And he made the point of, person on top, I want to try and pass the bottom person's guard without touching their hips in any way. And no one could do it. And he said, yeah, because it's impossible because every guard pass is essentially touching north of someone's knees and then adding the rest of yourself there. And then putting those two ideas together of, okay, so Chris Howard is saying over, under, around, or through. So I'm either going over the knees, under the knees, around the knees, or through the knees. And Chris Gow got saying, because he he called it G-spot passing. Um, (laughs) And he's got a great sense of humor. And he called it your guard spot. And your guard spot is your kneecap. And if someone's controlling your G-spot, they're passing your guard. And again, that kind of then forms back into what Preet was saying of, I don't want anyone in that kind of amber space between my knees and my elbows, because that then exposes my armpits and they're going to control me. And so then that kind of, again, formed kind of the battles of person on top and person on bottom, is that if I'm on the bottom playing guard, I do not want anyone touching north of my kneecaps, because that is a start of a guard pass. But I have to expose that, that space to be able to play attacks. And so it almost became like boxing in that I am now using my arms and legs to go for my attacks, but in a way that, right, I'm I'm exposing my knees. I'm aware I'm exposing my knees. Am I in danger right now? If the danger is too much, if the risk is too high, then I'll just retract and bring my knees closer and, and clean that space north of my kneecaps. But as the person on top, I'm then thinking, right, well, if I can hide that space behind my knees, behind my head, in my armpits and then start controlling north of their knees, I just need to then add myself, add more of my body north of their kneecaps, and that is essentially a pass. And that, again, like is, is how do I condense down all passes to make it that I don't have to then sit there for hours explaining individual passes to, I say, a massively complex problem of it could it be inside or outside? How much knee have they exposed? If they're not exposing any knee, you have a, an awful time passing. And then it's that hand fighting in the pocket, as in we both want our, our controls, we both have to expose, but what are we exposing? And if the person, if I can keep closed on top and make the person on the bottom expose their knees in some way, come at me, bro, they've given me a pass. And I don't have to then teach loads of passes, individual passes, like I said, of loads of 10-step programs to get around the guard when it can be bored down to right. Are you inside or outside? Defend that side of your body. If you're, if they're on the outside, keep your upper body away. If they're on the inside, don't expose the back of your knees. Are they exposing their kneecaps? If you can climb north of their knees and control them, good. 
And the way you're going to do that is if you go under their knees, over their knees, around their knees, or through their knees. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's funny you bring that up because this is exactly why that, you know, what you call the side grill chicken guard is so effective is because by doing that, you're denying access to your armpits and also to your knees as well. Um, and it's not just Preet who does the stuff. I mean, Lachlan Giles has uh, introduced that to his game as well. And I think we're going to see it expand into the meta because you're right to pass someone's guard you have to be able to control and get past their knees. That's the the legs are the first layer of defense. And usually the way you're going to get past that is by controlling the knees to some extent. The way that I've always explained this is uh, I've called it the three joint rule. And the idea being that if you consider how someone's legs work, and you can apply this to the arms just as well, but we're talking about guard passing here. So the first line of defense is going to be clearing the legs. There are three major joints in your legs. There's your hip joint, which is where the leg connects to your torso. There is the the knee joint, right? Which is kind of like the middle joint. And there is the, the end joint, which is your ankle. And in order for someone to really control your leg, they need to control at least two of those joints, right? I mean, if you think about, in, if you envision if for example, someone is sitting on the ground They're, you know, in that upside down turtle position where they're kind of like on the back, like a, like a stranded turtle and their legs are up in the air. If I grab them by the ankles, that's a bit of control and I can do stuff with it. You know, I can start moving into different entanglements and different controls, but it's not that powerful. If I just grab someone by the ankle, the legs just have too much locomotion with the other two joints in place. If I try to grab and secure your ankle, if the rest of your leg is free, you're going to be able to just pivot and swim your foot out and get it out. But if I can control your ankle and your knee, now you've got an issue, right? As soon as I've got control over two of those joints and I've taken two of them out of play, it's going to be very hard for you to do anything. You'll notice this if you're trying to pass someone's guard, right? If you try to do, for example, a leg drag pass, if you're just grabbing their ankle, it's just not going to work. But if you've got their ankle and their knee, it's a lot easier to control them. And so that's very much a key takeaway when it comes to passing from the guard, which is that when you want to control someone's leg, you want to be immobilizing at least two of the joints, which probably is going to mean that you've got the knee under control in those cases. So yeah, if the person has uh, the ability to move and twist and turn their knee, that's always going to let them regard and pummel and with their legs and kind of rotate and grand be away. But as soon as you lock that joint and they can't move their knee anymore, now you have a clear path to passing. And I think a mistake a lot of people make is they don't have sufficient control over the knees while they're trying to go for a pass. So so yeah, that should be kind of where you're, you know, your magnet when you're trying to pass the guard is you're always trying to control the people's knees and make sure that you've got the legs controlled. Then you can pass through and advance to the next step, which is usually they're going to bring their hands into play. And now you've got to clear those two. So there's kind of phases to passing and you've just got to make sure you do them in the right order. Well, this is actually it was what you just said reminded me of. Um, there's a wrestler who used to, to teach at the camps. I think he still does. I haven't seen him in a fair few years. Eric Bidek. And he came over to Europe and he, he did a, I think he was a brown belt under Henzo at the time, but he used to, um, I don't want to get this wrong because he may slam me if I get the university wrong, but I'm pretty sure he re- wrestled at Penn State. And if I get that wrong, I imagine that's like a, a huge faux pas and worthy of getting shot for. One of the things that he, he, he did like a little seminar at one of the Globetrotter camps and he, he, he asked the room, okay, well, how do you stop a double leg? And being jujitsu people, we all said sprawl. He went, nope. I'm like, oh, okay. He said, well, you know, if I'm having to sprawl to stop your double leg, I've messed up like a couple of times over. Like, first thing you've got to do is get past my hands. If you haven't got past my hands, then there's no double leg. If you get past my hands, you've got to get past my elbows. Like, I can hit you with my elbows and block you, you know, with those into your shoulders. If you get past my elbows, then yeah, now you're at my hips. Now I'm going to have to get my hips away. And all these years later, then kind of made me realize that that's exactly the same as guard. First thing you're going to have to do is, is clear the person's feet. Like once you clear the feet, you're going to have to clear the knees. Once you clear the knees, then you're going to have to get the hips, which they can then shrimp, <laughs> essentially a, a sprawl on the ground to be able to get their hands and their, their elbows back or uh, feet and knees back in again. And that kind of like marries into that idea that, right, I won't be able to control your wrists because that's the first step of getting towards your hips. Then I need to control your knees and that then allows me to get past that. Same with, like I said, like a leg drag and an arm drag. If I'm not controlling your elbows or passing your arms to the side in any way, there's no way I'm going to get a double leg. And again, that kind of informs that idea of being the top person hand fighting. 
in that if I want to accomplish anything, I'm going to have to hand my hand fight my way for it. I'm going to have to control your legs, and I'm going to have to control your hands, which you know, whenever I've likened it before, especially considering the control points that the person in guard wants behind the head, behind the armpits, and behind the knees. It's exactly the same as what a wrestler wants. So it's just like fighting a four-armed alien wrestler on the floor. It It is basically like trying to fight an octopus. Yeah. They want all the things that a wrestler does, but they've got twice the limbs going for it. Yeah. But as the person on bottom, I've got gravity and mobility on my side. Um, it was interesting as well. Like Again, all these like different points of view that kind of resonate and kind of stick together for me is that one thing Ryan Hall, I think, said in, in an interview a few years ago where... He said when he was, you know, again, it's been a while since I've listened to it, so I may murder it a lot, but he was saying about how when he was a colored belt, he would win from the guard a lot, and then that's kind of his thing. And he said the only way, I, you know, it made sense to win from the bottom is if you outskill the person on top, because the person on top should win. They're in a higher mobile position, and they've got gravity on their side, plus all their limbs still available. Person on the bottom, you're not mobile. You're not as mobile as someone on their feet. And gravity doesn't work upwards. So you're at a natural disadvantage. So you have to have just greater skill and dexterity with your arms and legs. And then as he got to black belt, he realized that, you know, who who was one of the best to ever do it was, you know, Roger. Where did Roger mostly win from? Mount. Like he took, you know, he, he went into a situation where even if his, you know, skill was on par with the other people in his division, just by virtue of being the person on top, he has now amplified his attributes with gravity and mobility, thus making him more likely to succeed. And so, you know, one thing that Ryan said in this interview, and I'm going to have to find it, make sure I, I, I don't get it hugely wrong, is that right when in a situation of equal skill, the person on top is more likely to win because they've got gravity and mobility on their side. So why wouldn't I try and maximize those attributes in competition? Which then kind of, again, goes all the way around to what everyone seems to be saying is just get up. Mm-hmm. And so it's from that kind of aggressive standpoint, again, like the, you know, the narrative has always been, if I'm in someone's guard, I'm the one in danger. When in fact, I'm the person on top. If I can change that narrative in my head that I'm not in, I'm not in that much danger, you're the person on their back. If you lose tension in, in your abs and, and legs, you're, you're done for. Like, you have nothing else to hope for at this point. How am I losing? I can cook you. I, I, as long as I keep myself safe, I can exhaust you. And then once you break, I, I've got everything, you know, even my lesser skill, just with the attributes of being on top, I will more likely win this exchange. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's funny. I think a lot of people, especially at the lower belts, they beat themselves up because they feel like they should be able to get submissions and sweeps off the bottom, but it's hard. And they think that, well, maybe I'm deficient in some way, but look, that's just the name of the game, right? You're fighting from a disadvantageous position. Yes, it is possible to overcome that disadvantageous position through technique and through conditioning and athleticism. It is possible to beat the person on top, but unless your strategy kind of dictates it. And there's a few cases where, you know, pulling guard makes sense. It, there, I'm not saying you should never, ever pull guard, right? I think that if you're, you know, going up against someone who is way bigger than you, it's a valid strategy to try to pull guard and fight aggressively from there. But In general, like you said, if all other variables are equal, I would much rather be the person on top. It is hard to submit a person or even to get a good sweep from the bottom because by definition, you're fighting from a disadvantage, even if you're really good at guard. And again, you can overcome that. But if all things are equal, I would prefer to try to get on top position and attack from there instead. I think where people get into trouble is where they get greedy and they create openings themselves that their opponent can exploit. So you've talked about the importance of keeping your your elbows in tight and denying access to your knees, right? That is something that if you make a mistake, it becomes much, much easier for the person on bottom to sweep you or submit you. And a lot of the time, the reason why that person on bottom was able to go into a sweeping sequence or do that back take from guard or submit you it's because you extended your arm too much because you got greedy trying to grip or maybe you you brought your knee too close and you were able to to give them control of your leg and i think that that's an important lesson for people on top as well which is when you're attacking someone from the guard you need to be a little bit 
frugal, for lack of a better word. You you don't want to just go in there and try to get grips without thinking about the consequences. You always have to be thinking, if I extend my arm, this person might grab my my elbow and arm drag me or something like that, right? If I if I give them too much access to my leg, they might get behind my knee and they might launch into the things that you talked about. So kind of staying compact and not making it easy for them to isolate an arm, isolate a leg. That's a very important defensive structure that you maintain, even if you're on top position. Because again, if one of your arms or legs gets pulled free, that's what gives the person on the bottom the ability to go into those attack sequences. That's again, like it was that that tree falling in the woods moment for me of of realizing that, you know, same as how I say that, you know, being conditioning people to go onto their back is like a parasite, you know, and it was, I hate to do a plug, but in the last uh, Fanatics DVD I, I, we did, we uh, talked about the idea that I don't teach guard to beginners just because it's too high coordination. You, I'm sitting you in a, in, a, in a position where I need you to move your arms and legs independently like a drummer under penalty of death. Like That's quite a complex thing to, to try and get your head around, especially when you have little control of your body at this point. And so this, again, it's this kind of conditioned response on top that if I'm the person on top, I have to pass. It is imperative that I pass. I'm in danger. This person's playing guard. I'm going, I'm going to get destroyed. When in fact that if I can settle into people's head, like, no, if you're the person on top, you're winning. Doesn't matter what, if they're in guard or not, you're, you're winning still. Then there isn't that imperative to to pass the guard so you don't have to expose as much as someone who's under that fear of oh i'm here i must pass otherwise i'm doomed you can stay like i say a lot more relaxed keep yourself a lot more compact like defend the back of your legs and and your arms and and, in your head and just hand fight that person wait for your moment instead of thinking if i don't do something now i'm done for it's that it's doing too much is a lot worse than doing nothing at all sometimes just keep everything tight keep i mean it was it was fun watching people do hand fighting at the adccs last year and how you know little there was as in they get quite close to each other and everything would remain tight and they'd essentially keep their elbows pinned to their sides and just you know fight with their hands like little daleks as it were and like (laughs) very very controlled until the moment came that they should pass reminded me of like watching a lot of like them black belts you know play from from the guard it's like they were kind of happy to you know okay you're down there i'm up here we're in guard that's fine i don't need to pass i don't see you know we've got time i'm gonna hand fight from here and if you expose yourself then i'll get you but i don't have to because i feel relatively safe that you're in as much danger as i am and i think that was like again that kind of turning moment of all submissions are normally taught from the person on the bottom's perspective not the person on top now if i can leg lock you you're in as much danger as I am. So why, and, and if anything, you're in the worst circumstances because I'm on top. I'm not burning right now. Like you're, you're having to keep your, your legs tight and your abs tight to survive this. I'm not. I'm on my feet, which I was born to do. Yeah, absolutely. Well, hey, Chris, I am mindful of the fact that the sun's probably coming up over there. And I, I want to make sure that you get your beauty sleep because we both know that you need it. <laughs> Thanks. So- oh, dude. <laughs> Like an hour and 20 ago, you, you laid into me with a little jab. And now here we are, you know, I'm, I'm depleted. It's 3.20 in the morning. You're like, you know what? You can take another one before he goes to bed. You know what that's called, Chris? That's called strategy, you know. <laughs> wait, wait until you're at your weakest and then you strike. But in seriousness, though, was there anything else that you thought was worth bringing up here on the topic of topside grip fighting that we need to cover? Again, I think it was, uh, the main point behind it is this idea that it's funny that we should talk about this after the UFC at the weekend. I mean, I haven't seen the fight, but I've seen a lot of the rundowns about it. Uh, oh but- boy, I know exactly what you're going to talk about. <laughs> do, I, do I have to bring it up? <laughs> I, we probably should bring it up just because the, people often listen to this thing after the fact. So yeah, you should probably explain it. Crone playing, pulling guard relentlessly. And <laughs> I think especially, definitely go down another rabbit hole here, is that you look at, okay, so... From a historical perspective, you know where the the origins of judo is. You had the you know people do you know to my knowledge, I might be completely wrong. I'm not a historian, but people doing traditional jujitsu, you know, back in Japan, essentially cosplaying as samurai and warriors, as in there is no war. We're not fighting, but we're going to pretend 
we're going to see us, you know, we're going to do compliant training and, you know, sometimes hard training and we'll get bashed around a little bit, but we're definitely not fighting. But we're going to cosplay as we are. I think we're tough. And then judo comes around and goes, you know what? Screw this. Let's actually turn this into something competitive and make a decent sport out of it. And then it seems to be almost going the same way in jujitsu is that we we live in this, you know, the good old days, you know, you know the reason why MMA exists is because of Hoist Gracie and we were the best at the beginning and, but it's not that way anymore. Like it's very rare for someone on the bottom in, in an MMA competition to win. And, you know, one of our biggest exponents that we have in MMA right now, the, the purest form of jiu-jitsu are Gracie. And he, he makes us look silly. And we're, we're cosplaying as warriors again. It's gone all the way around to 150 years ago. We were looking at these actual savages who, who dominate each other. They don't do what we do. But we live in this bubble of, well, this is what, you know, you wouldn't have MMA. And people do still do submissions. Like I said about Fyodor and um, Noguera. Like, cool, yeah, he, you know, he completely shut down his jiu-jitsu just because he was like, I don't have to engage in your game. People still get submissions, but it's not from a jiu-jitsu standpoint, I'd argue. It's someone doing wrestling and then catching a submission off the wrestling instead of what you'd see in normal gyms of jiu-jitsu i think we've, we've definitely gone into a uh state of decay in that in that we we, we think we're warriors i think we're, we're hard people still but we're not we're, mm. we're definitely cosplaying as that and when you have one of us then suddenly thrown into that mix it definitely exposes how weak we have become yeah i i think it's a good example of how much we're protected by our own rule sets i think part of the reason why people grapple the way they do is because it really feels like a lot of the rule sets we operate under are really tailored to emphasize the guard, right? To make the guard yeah. look good and to make people play the guard. I mean, I've talked about this on the show. I do not for the life of me understand why a takedown and a sweep would be worth the same points, right? In my mind, a takedown should be worth more. I also don't understand why if I come up on top from turtle, I get no points but if I come up on top from guard, I get uh, two points, right? That is just a completely arbitrary distinction that someone made. And they did that because they had, I guess, had it in their head. I mean, I'm, again, I'm not a historian, so I don't know the reason. But it feels like it was because, look, we got to sell people on this guard stuff. But the problem is when you pull people out of that rule set, you start to really see how much that rule set protects us. Because you're right, if you go and you try to butt scoot around in MMA, that is very rarely, I mean, unless you're Shinya Aoki against Eddie Alvarez, it's a very, very unlikely strategy to succeed because you've basically given up the advantage of gravity, the advantage of your body's natural ability to walk on two feet. And instead you're kind of scooting around like a dog with tapeworms, right? That's not a good thing to be doing <laughs> from a combat situation. Yeah, completely. And that's what I say, like in competitive jiu-jitsu, especially with the ADCC and, and legs becoming more important, is is kind of changing the dynamic where it comes to guard. I don't think it's you know I don't think it's going to be the same way as it is now as it is going to be in maybe ten years time. It's definitely it, you know it's, compared to how it was. Imagine when we started, it's, it's wildly different. There was three guards. It was it was closed butterfly in half, and nothing else. You just stood up and wrestled again. And so gym jujitsu seems to be the outlying sport, as it doesn't resemble you know the kind of direction that. You know, especially with leg locking rules and ADCC rules and submission only rules seem to be taking the guard currently. It doesn't resemble that. It doesn't resemble what happens in MMA. And again, like, you know, people kind of laugh at jujitsu and say, yeah, we wouldn't pull guard in a street fight. Yeah, of course we wouldn't. We won't be the person on top. Cool, but how often do you just train that? Mm -hmm. Oh. <laughs> like, yeah, but we, we go on top. Yeah, but you don't do takedowns. Like, you pull guard. <laughs> um, and so. The three things that, you know, most people would want to associate with prowess of, you know, competition, self-defense, or MMA, gym jiu-jitsu doesn't allow for any of those things. Again, we're cosplaying as warriors. Yeah. We, we think we're, we're capable of these things when majority of the time we do not train them in the slightest. And, you know, you stick a, a mildly skilled MMA fighter in a jiu-jitsu gym or mildly skilled wrestler with a basic understanding that they have a neck and arms. And you watch jujitsu people fall apart. Like they have no idea what the hell they're supposed to yeah. do. 
I think there we do run the risk. I mean, I don't think we're obviously at the point where we're anywhere near some of those other, you know, watered down LARPing martial arts, for lack of a better word. I mean, no. Oh, God, no, 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 no. Yeah. I mean, jujitsu does work, although I, I don't even have problems with people taking the bottom position, although I would just suggest that if you want to play off the bottom, make sure that you've actually entered that position with good grips, right? Don't just sit on the ground and wait for your opponent to come to you. That's kind of that that jujitsu etiquette that I think we need to train people out of yes. because it's not effective. But look, if you stand up and you get judo grips, and then instead of going for a throw, you just sit right down into a sweep, I, I mean, sure, do your thing, right? But at least then you had a strategy. That's much better than just sitting there and waiting for them to come to you. Oh, completely. I, was, I don't know why it just popped in my head. I don't know if it's kind of important. One thing, especially when, when Charles Harriet was showing me this this Kindle guard I mentioned earlier, um, so he calls it the elbow frame, but I think that's boring. <laughs> One thing that kind of came out of it was this idea of, if I try and stand up off the bottom, if you're not controlling me, I'm going to get up. But one thing that kind of like he you know, destroyed me with and he, he watched him destroy other people with it, black belts and brown belts, etc., was if he suddenly decides to get up, they completely kazushi themselves to stop him that like they may be reserved as possible you know hanging back you know keeping everything nice and safe and not engaging like you just said like you know if you could, you could pull guard and the other person's just going to meander towards you but if i suddenly decide to get up again their tact changes like they're going to suddenly like dive at me and dive at my hips to stop me from standing which all those things i just wanted their head their arms their armpits they just gave me and their balance it was hilarious. Like he was doing a bit of butterfly guard, and you know I'm obviously going to sit back on my heels and not you know expose myself and not lean forwards and, and give away my center of gravity. And then he just scooted back a little bit and started to stand. I was like, oh shit! And I like dived at him, and all of a sudden I'm going through the air. <laughs> and so that again, like reiterate that idea that if I see someone pull guard, I'm assuming that I've just done a a Jedi takedown, and you're hitting the floor. And if I'm not engaging and, and controlling you and, again, hand-fighting you and trying to enter through that pocket and pin you to the ground, you're going to get up. And so it was really interesting, like, you know, again, this kind of, like I said, this, we're, we're, we're a very conditioned sport into our rule set. And we kind of get a very tunnel-visioned view of fighting. Like, you know, one person, it's almost like a gentleman's agreement. It's constantly like, you're going to be on your back. I'm going to be up here. You're going to stay on your back. And we're going to fight like this for a bit. Instead of this is not a fight. This is not. This is nothing that resembles anything like a combat anymore. It may do, and it's it's almost like again how judo's gone in the sense of oh you can't touch the legs, oh you can't touch this, you can't touch that, and so it's now this upright jacket fighting, and you know exposing the legs, exposing everything. And I feel we're doing the exact same. And you know coming across someone who isn't engaging from the top, isn't being aggressive hand fighting and trying to break through the pocket the second that person's assets the ground it's amazing how much they'll 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 throw themselves around for you the second you try and stand up from the bottom yeah yeah. it's also hilarious to see just how baffled people get when you stand up from the bottom like especially with people who are you know maybe they haven't been training to the point where they're like a black belt but they've been training enough that they understand the the culture right so a blue belt or a purple belt you just stand up and they look at you like you can do that. <laughs> you know, they, it just it just breaks their brain sometimes that fuck this guy just stood up. Well, if that's not jujitsu, what do I do now? I had that recently. I was I was in Virginia and I was wrong with the purple belt, and I just kept on like pulling my bottom leg free to like half get up and then stop again. And he just burst out laughing. I went, I don't know how to pass your guard. I was like, I'm not even playing guard. Like I'm literally sitting half on my ass, just keeping pulling my bottom leg out and doing half a technical stand up. And you're like, I don't know how to pass now because every time I get near him, he starts to stand up again. And I'm like, that's, oh, that's terrifying. <laughs> that I can literally just break your entire passing system by threatening to stand up a little bit. I know that this is a conversation on grip fighting from the top, but just a piece of advice for people if you're playing the bottom, right? If you ever find yourself in that position where you're sitting on the ground, they're standing up, and you have no grips. Don't just sit there and wait for them to come to you. That's a terrible idea. Just <laughs> Even if you want to play the bottom, right? Even if for some reason you really want to play bottom position, maybe that's your strategy, or maybe you're afraid of, of stand-up injuries, or maybe you're just giving up a lot of size and you feel like you'd be better off on the bottom. At the bare minimum, stand up again, get your grips, then sit down. 
because at least then you're sitting down with the fucking grips, right? The worst thing you can do <laughs> is just sit there and wait for them to come to you because there's no obligation for that person to play jujitsu with you. They might just run around you, right? There's a lot of things that could happen. You don't want to be seated like that and have no grips. So my suggestion is always, if you must be the bottom player, if you really want to, you don't have to do takedowns with the person, but at least stand up, get your grips and then sit back down again, right? You'll still be better off than if you just sat there and did nothing and waited for them to come to you. Exactly. I think, again, if I was to finish on any point is that a lot of, you know, kind of what I've been, we've been talking about throughout this, this past 90 minutes is not normal jujitsu. Like, you know, it's, it's kind of, it's, it's where the conversation is definitely going and you know a lot of, of places like b team and and dan Hur's bunch and whoever you know the high level kind of gyms and people thinking outside the box but there's still a lot of people you know a lot of gyms out there who are still bread and butter right day one we're going to do close guard and i think it makes sense to us like when you have the you know like you say like we we, we would put a lot of emphasis on the guard historically and the person on top was the the person just there to get submitted or swept or instigate a given pass from a certain circumstance. But now this whole idea, I think, of the person on the bottom could get up. The person on top has to engage. So that, and again, like in, in the world of leg locks, it completely changes that dynamic of, right, I have to be way more aggressive on top. If I'm not hand fighting, this person has way too many options available. Uh, that could be a detriment to me. And if I'm on top, I have the advantage right now. Why would I lose it? The problem I think is, and this is, you know, something I had to address myself is that, right, well, how am I going to go about teaching this? How do I change? We're all saying these same messages, but if we're still doing the dogmatic approach of teaching, like, you know, okay, cool. We all know it's important to stand up. We all know that leg locks are available, but what do we still still show on day one? All right, here's close guard. Mm -hmm. Or even like, if you're trying to think, you know, on the periphery, we're still going to show something, you know, related to that, like trying to be different. I said again from this position of guilt is that, you know, trying to be different. I'm not going to show closed guard. I'm going to show open guard. It's still guard. Like you're still asking someone who hasn't got dexterity over all their limbs to use them like a drummer again. And it's it's difficult to completely break that mold. And like I said, you know, his preet saying the exact same thing you know pull yourself out and get up on top fantastic i think that was you know brilliant technique preet fantastic worthless because they haven't changed how they're going to train in the gym like you're still infecting people with this parasite of normal dogmatic jujitsu instead of right i mean the hardest thing to do and is you know if you if you set yourself the precedent of right well the first guard i'm going to teach is just framing and standing up I don't want people to play guard at all. Then what do you put in its place? Like how do you then form classes where guard isn't a factor in jujitsu, you know, for the first six months to a year of someone's career? Like, you know, that's no passing. That's no sweeping. That's no close guard. That's no half guard. That's no nothing. How do you go about that? What do you put in its place? And when a lot of us have, have come through the way we have, it's anxiety inducing to go, right, well, I hope I don't fuck up my students by doing this. <laughs> Because this, you know, this is what everyone's done anyway. And I went to to Ryan's gym whilst I was in the DC Virginia area, Ryan Hall, and I loved his approach. Like watching him teach was 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 stunning. I absolutely loved it. Like his his conceptual way of doing things. And I sat down with him afterwards. And I went, you know, the, the, it's been hard for me to step away from normal dogmatic jujitsu and and be more like this. And like you know, where did you find? How did you find that you could you were capable of doing it? And he said, well. What makes those guys right? Like, you know, someone had to come up with the current method at some point who says that that was the right method. So find your own way. It's, you know, that's what they did. And and if you find success of what you do, if you can look at it from that humble approach and, and analytical approach of is it working or is it not working, then why not? And that kind of like really hit home with me. Okay, well, this makes more sense to me. Like being on top is is important and and that narrative has to change of the importance of being on top against the normal jujitsu approach of the person on the bottom being the the more important person, which makes no sense in any other realm 
of combat sport. Um, yeah, it's, it's kind of like trying to, I mean, intentionally going to bottom when you don't have to is kind of like intentionally driving your car into a ditch to see if you're a good enough driver to get out of it again. Exactly. <laughs> it's like, well, how do we then change it? And I love what you're doing and, and Greg Soders and, and Pre and you know, all the other intelligent people out there who are, who are rewriting this. But again, like, you know, as, as, as the messaging has been going across it everywhere, like it's, it's fantastic. But the hardest part is, has been, right, or how do I step out of the dogmatic approach? Like I've been conditioned to do it this way for the past 14 years. How do I throw it away? Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Well, I mean, that's probably a conversation for another day, but to tie this yes. one up, Chris, if you don't mind, I would like to present to you the Chris Payne's playbook for grip fighting from the top. So if I recapped this episode properly, I think you had kind of eight main points and you tell me if I missed any of these. Number one is to win the grip fight first. Basically, don't try to initiate a pass or an advancement if you're getting your ass kicked on the grip fight. Number two is to deny the guard. You know, don't just walk into their guard and just let it happen. Make it difficult for them to establish and lock up a guard. Number three is to deny that armpit space. Like you said, you know, keep your elbows in tight. Don't let the person get those underhooks in. Don't let them get access to your elbow. Number four is control their legs to prevent them from standing up. Number five is knowing whether you've got inside or outside position, because that allows you to somewhat predict what the other person's going to do. Number six is hiding access to your knees so that they can't get into leg entanglements or easily get underneath you. Number seven is clear the layers in order. So like you said, if you're trying to get through their guard, get through the feet first, then you're probably going to have to deal with the hand frames, but you want to do those in the sequence that they're presented. And then number eight is stay coiled. Avoid extending your arms or legs out for no good reason, because that's how you as the person on top create those openings that the person on the bottom can attack. Was that a good recap or did I miss anything? Yeah, I think the last point I'd say is that that change the narrative in your head. Like You're not the person who is due to lose here. Like You have Change that narrative of the person, you know, that jujitsu narrative that the person in the guard is the better person right now. Like they're the one who is one step away from being completely fucked up. If they lose focus on their legs for a second, they're doomed. So why are you afraid? Like if you control them, if you keep safe and control them in that grip fight, what have they got? Like you're on top and do you have to pass? Yeah, definitely. Well, hey, Chris, time for some plugs. Of course, I know that you've got that amazing how to defend everything video that went viral a while back. You talked about that earlier. I will put a link to that in the show notes, and I'll also put a link to your fanatics instructionals. Is there anything else you wanted to plug, like maybe how people could contact you or follow you on social or anything else that's worth promoting while we're here? Yeah, sure. So if anyone is interested in this, anything I've said, uh, you can find me easily on Instagram, Chris Paynes, the villain. You type that into Google, I'm sure you'll find me as well. There is a YouTube channel that I occasionally post to, plus any ideas I seem to have in my head, I put on a Patreon channel. Like people can, you know, I, I post there pretty regularly of stuff that I may be embarrassed to say out loud that I'm currently doing in class, I'll show on there. Like, I have this idea. I don't know if it's that good, but what do you guys think? It seems to be there. And yeah, like I said, these, these new fanatics have just dropped the elbow frame and standing up with Charles Harriet, and then uh, the, my, my personal one, how to learn jujitsu. And if anyone does end up watching any of those things and wants to give me feedback, I'd be very appreciative. Not trying to say, oh, you have to buy it and give me feedback. Like, if you do end up buying it, I always appreciate I'm very open to getting better. I mean, one thing that I've kind of realized since doing all this, having to deal with everyone who just stands the fuck up, is <laughs> if I could demote myself down a couple of belts right now, I would. In that I thought I was doing all right in jiu-jitsu, you know, bobbing along black belt. And then all of a sudden, dealing with people who just stand up all the time, I realized that I have no idea how to control people. Which, yeah, from a, from a negative point of view, like, oh, God. Like, I don't know what the hell I'm doing. But from a positive point of view, I thought I was doing all right at Black Belt. Now, I feel like a blue belt again. There's so much to learn. Terrifyingly, what have I wasted 14 years on? So yeah, any any kind of feedback on this? Like, everything's kind of changing on almost like a day-to-day -day basis right now. So I'd be very appreciative if anyone sees any of that content and just goes, ah, go in this direction. Like, I'm still blue belt enough to go, I need this information. 
Fantastic. Well, I appreciate that mindset, man. And like you suggested there, I'll put all of those links in the show notes. So if people want to check out Chris's work or contact him, all of that info will be there. Just pop open your podcast player, go to description or info or whatever it's called, and you'll just see everything there, one tap, and you can find Chris. I'll also put a link into our stuff there. For those who don't know everything we make, you can find it all on bjjmentalmodels.com. The podcast is entirely free. There's no ads. We're entirely subscriber support which I'll get to in a second, but there's, you know, thousands and thousands of hours of timeless educational jujitsu content on there, really a wealth of knowledge from people like Chris. So I do recommend exploring the back catalog if you haven't already. That's also how you can sign up for our awesome newsletter, which uh, blasts out extensions of these conversations and really useful tips on a weekly basis. Again, also entirely free if you do want to kick it up to the next level. And if you want to support us here, BJJ Mental Models Premium is the way to do that. Sign up for our premium service and you get a few things. You get get our uh, entire audio masterclass course catalog. So we've got dozens and dozens of courses up there right now done with a lot of really awesome coaches who explain their method. We cover a lot of different things from how to be a better grappler to the actual mechanics of jujitsu to strategy to how to be a better coach as well. That's something that we're exploring a lot. We're in the process of rolling out some new courses that are specifically tailored for coaches. And in fact, Chris, to your point, something I've been thinking about is maybe doing a course about modern coaching methods and rethinking jujitsu and maybe getting into gamification and ecological dynamics and stuff like that. So that's a hot topic as well. Beyond the courses, you also get direct coaching from our Black Belt Review team. This is probably one of the craziest deals in the sport, right? You can spend hundreds of dollars on an instructional and get some content from a person who doesn't even know you exist or you can pay us the 20 30 bucks a month depending on your tier and you can actually get direct coaching from that same person so i definitely highly recommend that you explore the coaching service of course there's a ton of other perks including our community we actually just today announced and i'm very excited about this that going forward if you sign up for bjj mental models premium you get a free lifetime yoga for bjj subscription That's a hell of a deal. So I do recommend people check it out if they haven't already. Again, you can find all of that at bjjmentalmodels.com. Or if you're truly lazy like me, just go to your podcast app and go to the show notes and I'll put a link in there. But Chris, man, thanks again so much for coming by. I do appreciate it. Lots of great knowledge. Thanks for putting up with my bad jokes. Uh, And thanks for staying up late. I will let you go get some sleep now. I've actually got to be awake in about two hours' time to teach a private. <laughs> <laughs> so I think I, I think I planned this wrong. <laughs> Might as well just keep going. Maybe give Sonny Brown a shout and see if he can do a quick bang out an episode of you, with you in an hour because there's no point going back to sleep now. <laughs> exactly. He's going to be wide awake. Like That's the problem with like, either, it's either you or Sonny and you're both <laughs> at terrible times. Like, I sit in the middle and it's like, it just sucks either way. <laughs> Well, I I really, truly do appreciate it, Chris. Thanks so much for staying up late here with us to make this happen. No, thank you for having me. I've been so excited to come back on. I even bought a new mic so I'd sound better. You sound fantastic. I wish everyone would do that. (laughs) (laughs) thank, Thank you for inviting me back on again. No problem. Glad to have you, man. And thanks for everyone who hangs out with here and listens every week. I do appreciate it. We'll talk to you soon. Take care.